All right. People will really like this show, apparently. All right, let's see if anyone shows up. So I just tweeted it, and someone immediately said, you lied to us. <laughs> they keep you honest. Let's check some balances. Yeah. We should have more guests on the show. Well, technically, you say it's Is that lie. you saying that, or is that... I mean, I'm saying, to be I'm, saying, I'm saying we need people that aren't us three. To be fair, this is only the second time that the three of us have been on this show in two months. So <laughs> That is your fault. I'm just saying, you're saying things, and I don't think there's any foundation. You don't think we need more guests? Things. I think that's fine to say, but I don't... Man on the street. Yeah, there you go. We need man on the street interviews. <laughs> Why am I getting an echo? Oh, I'm you not, know why? I'm not getting an echo. That's so funny. I'm not getting an echo. I am because I had the YouTube window open to get the chat. Mm -hmm. And then when you went live, there was a delay. And then it started auto-playing because auto-playing video is the devil incarnate. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, Damien, we all live with it every day. Yes. Scott, how your, hello, everybody. How was your foot? Uh, my foot and my ankle, I sprained it. So I've got my, uh, my big chunky brace on today. I was honest today. What, what extreme sport did you hurt yourself doing? Oh, oh yeah. It, it was I actually was, uh, during a team meeting, right? You were kicking butts and yeah, no, I was, uh, I was, uh, Skyping my mother and walking down the stairs at home with my surface to show her the new Ottoman <laughs> that arrived at pottery barn. And I missed the bottom step. And you next thing I knew, point? you went two steps, or you thought there was one additional step. No, I think you know it's that classic thing of you thought you're at the bottom of the stairs, but you're mm. actually one short of the bottom of the stairs. And then I went, you know, I would say something English Australian here, but I won't. Um, I, next thing I knew, I was on my butt, and my mum had a great view of the probably the ceiling or the wall or the carpet or something. Um, and it didn't hurt until I tried to get up and walk in, and then I probably swore. And uh, continued to show her the ottoman because it was you know, worthwhile. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then handed it over to my son to say hello to grandma while I went and lay on the floor and sort of cried for a bit and then went to emergency where they determined it wasn't broken, which I was very happy. Did um, you think it was broken? I wasn't sure. Like I've, I've sprained my ankle badly maybe once before. Um, and wow. it was just the, the inability, literally inability to put any weight on it whatsoever without my leg just completely collapsing. Um, and it was hard to isolate. It was just that kind of pain that felt like it was the whole foot that was messed up. Anyway, are you, two are days you hobbling later, right now? Yeah, I'm hobbling around, but I'm I am able. <sighs> that sucks. I drove in, so it's not that bad. Being being forty, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be fair, the last time I sprained my ankle, I was fourteen. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I was playing soccer at the time, but still, you know, I just one of those guys oh, who rolls okay. his ankle. I tweeted about how I'm still jet lagged, and it's been two weeks. <laughs> no, you're just old, Scott. <laughs> and, and and like all of the incredibly helpful tweets from you, you horrible, horrible people, are no, no, no. That's just old. I'm like, no, I'm pretty sure it's jet lagged. I feel the jet lag. You know what I mean? I'm going to bed at ten o'clock, and it's destroying my life. Yeah. yeah and then everyone like... else, everyone else just says, "Oh, melatonin," but they never tell you when to take it. You just walk outside, isn't that how you get melatonin? Have you been? Oh, you to mean Oregon? to go to sleep? Oh well, you know. But do you sure. take the melatonin when you're about to sleep or when you're about to wake up in the yeah. afternoon? If you do take it wrong, then you'll be jet lagged and you haven't even gone anywhere. Scotch works wanna... good for me, but you know, each to their own. Who works for you? Scotch works well for me if I'm trying to go to sleep, <laughs> but each to their own. Oh, alcohol. Yeah, alcohol works. I thought own. you were referring to the tape. <laughs> <laughs> I tape my eyes down. I was like, I don't know. I don't I don't speak I don't speak alcohol. Okay. <laughs> um turn on your lower thirds. People don't know which oh, of the uh, Mine's on. you are. That's just me. Okay. Oh. All right. Hello everyone. It's the ASP.net community stand up. And uh, as we do every week, we alternate. This is the morning one. So we have if you, if you can't tell already. <laughs> we, have friends, all we have friends from India. We have friends from Brazil, from Argentina on right now. Hello to all of you all. Good evening from India right there. Um, and uh, keep in mind, of course, that at any moment, Google Hangouts could be disappear and we won't know how to use it. Or right? get renamed or shut or get down. Renamed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Um, and of course, people are on the chat right there. Uh, we have chat. We haven't figured out how to persist the chat. So be aware that no. when the chat goes away, it's gone forever. It's gone. We're working on that yes. part. We we have also chat, just to be clear, if you go to liveaspnet.com and you like, live.asp.net, and then you click on the video, it'll yep. launch in YouTube, and there is chat in that view. Okay, right. The old Hangouts view is gone, is my understanding. Which so, sucks. Yeah. 
the other thing is that we had three different people send us code to talk to the YouTube API, and they did it with .NET Core at the command line, which was nice, uh, to download the videos from this playlist. And then now we have to figure out, and you don't have to do this, we have to do this, how to upload those to Channel 9. Because we have lots of other friends, including people in Iran and China who don't necessarily have access to YouTube. So we are working on it, but understand that it is a low priority because we have, uh, I've got a bunch of conferences next week. We've got Connect coming up in um, New York in November, and we have the MVP Summit. So bear with us. We are trying, but... Uh, we, we could maybe get Seth into this. I've tried, but Seth also has a full-time job. Oh, man. Um, I, it's it's tough. I, we can ask him. I can give you the code, John. If no, you want to see maybe it. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, it's the but, same reason we don't have the live chat integrated on the site. <laughs> yes. the, the ultimate goal would be to you just go to live.asp.net. The video mm -hmm. is there. The chat is embedded. And then when the show is over, it auto goes into the playlist. You can play an old show and the yep. chat would come up. That is all possible. We know it's just code. It's yep. just it takes time. It's and just code. It's just code. It's just that it takes time. And we yeah, just yeah. haven't. It's not a priority for us right now. We've got people in Germany, Greece. Hello from Nigeria. Rock on. Yeah. Very cool. OK. Um, oh, another thing that was exciting. I haven't talked to you about this yet, Damien. But uh, Maria has got, .NET, uh, has got Nerd Dinner ported over to Core 101 right now. She's redoing the CSS. So we may have a Nerd Dinner sample coming out soon. And we're going to relaunch the Nerd Dinner site on uh, entirely on Core on Azure, which will be cool. And that will be another nice sample for people. So we'll have her on the show in the next cool. couple of weeks. Now, Tuesday next week on the 25th, the um, I'm going to be at Dev Intersections. I wonder, I guess there's really no time for us to do the show. We may not have a show next week unless you all want to do it yourselves. Are you around next week, John? Uh, next week, I'm not around. All right. We'll, we'll probably have to cancel next week, but I am around the 1st of November, so there'll be two weeks before we, uh, we do it again. All right, cool. Okay, let's. Uh, you want to do show some stuff, uh, Damien? And actually, this question is oh, already coming. This question is already John, sh shooting. John by. has his. Does John love community this week, or is John? I, just I always love community. community. Oh, he's, no, he's, no. John loves community. Yeah, let me jump in. Our jingles are so high quality. All right, oh, they're so high quality. Here I go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, could you keep the music going, actually, in the background? while I'm presenting these, that'd be nice. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> OK, so uh, two from Hisham here. This is uh, part four on his extending or on his uh, request filtering. Awesome stuff. Uh, Hisham here, he's <laughs> I'm about to mute you now. I have a problem. Pardon, oh. everybody. <laughs> Uh, okay, Hisham's got this thing where he's got a .NET res gen. So he's created a CLI command really? yeah, for resource generation. So he made this like, or we made this? I think. Uh, I don't know. No, we didn't make it, I believe yeah. so. Yeah, I think I think it's saying he did. Well, this was on our list of things to make, though. Well, he beat Yeah, so it. it's interesting because with the move of .NET Core projects back to MS Build, there brings up the, the likelihood that we'll be able to use the existing MS Build targets for doing resource generation. Um, however, I haven't looked exactly at what he's done here. So he may have added, like he says translation. So did he like call out to some translation API and automatically generate resources, which is really cool if he did do that. So I'm not saying anything's wasted here. I'm just, I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure what he's trying to replace or what gap he's trying to fill that might be coming back as a result of that work. I'm not sure. Yeah. But what I'm trying cool, to understand but... is, did he do something that, that, that we don't have to do now because he did it already? Well, so it looks Possibly. like. Possibly. I don't know. Yeah. So it looks like you're generating resource files. Yeah, I don't know. But. Well, hang on. Let's just look, pay attention for a second here. ResGen is a .NET full framework thing. He's gone and made .NET ResGen. So he's made ResGen as a .NET command, Damien. Mm -hmm. So he'll go and make ResX files. Yes, which is what the MS build task on full framework does today, right? Right. Oh, hang on, so sorry. Makes res sorry, say that again. I may have. He will generate a whatever culture dot resx resource file. From what? What input? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm Maybe if there's a. Let's read the docs here, friends. Scroll down. 
He's saying generates an fr.resx file from a resource.resx uh -huh. file with en as the de default culture. So um, it looks like you start with a default culture one, and he will generate language-specific ones. Using some type of translation API, like Google? Or no, Bing no, no. Or? I think he's just bootstrapping the thing. Just creating oh. the – yeah, so now you can go and fill in the blank, though, right, as opposed to creating – having to do all the keys. Scroll up. Got to do your homework, John. It seems like it must be more than that because uh, you could just. Oh, no, no, look, look. And it translates the. No, no. And it translates the resource yeah. entries with the translation API. So there it's a go. jump start. It's a jump starter. Yeah, I was nice. going to say, otherwise, I mean, to generate the files, you just copy paste them and. Yeah, change yeah, yeah. The so he's, sure. made a, he's made a, a jump starter. Yeah, oh, very nice. Cool. All right. Cool. Ah. More localization stuff. This is Daniel, and he's got an article on localization and some nice. Uh, this is an article on .NET Curry. He's got some, you know, nice um, graphics and stuff here to help you understand it. So. Two here from uh, Fiaz, and his thing says, call me Fizz, so I'm going to call him Fizz. Uh, so he's got two, or first of all, he's got this Polymer series. This actually finished in September, but I didn't notice it before. So this is, Polymer is web components, um, a web components uh, library, and so he goes through and builds a to-do application. Um, so here's a Polymer component, and then he goes through uh, on the back end and builds out a web API and kind of all wraps it all up. So a uh, very nice three-part series. Um, here's another one uh, from him as well. And this is on uh, .NET Core Secret Manager tool. So you know we've mentioned this before, but a very good reminder. I continually run into people that are throwing their code you know, in configuration. And, and uh, don't do that. Don't share your secrets. So. Uh, OK, this is from Steve Gordon on debugging into ASP.NET Core source. And what he did here is grab the, co the source code from GitHub and went through and debugged it. Um, so set setting that up in global JSON and showing how to go and debug through that code. Andrew Locke, uh, regular offender here. So here he's back with uh, this one is modifying the UI based on user authorization in ASP.NET Core. So what he's getting to is a, a service that allows him to, if you're authenticated, then you've you know you've you've changed the navigation. If if you're not authenticated, then you don't. So I'm going to make an observation here, John, which may be way off track, mm. but I don't think it is. As it seems, this is a good thing in my mind. It seems as ASP.NET Core and .NET Core have been out there a little longer, the types of articles that we're seeing are seem to now be less of the, here's what ASP.NET Core is and what .NET Core is, and this is how you get started, and more of the, here's how you do like useful application pattern X using ASP.NET Core, um, which is great to see, yeah. like this, it, which is really, really great to see. Now, we've still got a nice chunk of articles which are like, here's how you do this thing, because I built a tool that is you know, perhaps a gap in the current stack, um, but I'm really enjoying the fact that we're seeing these types of articles, these little bite-sized, oh, here's just how you do something really simple, but uh, may not be particularly obvious because you know there isn't a web forms controller or anything anymore to do the user view or whatever it used to be called. So you have to write a little bit of code and it tells you mm -hmm. how to do it. Yep. This is a very nice, this is a very well written. Um, I like this. And also he's using yeah. that, by the way. Just just but <laughs> and, I just think that this is a these are the, like this is the I've said before that it is the 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 golden age of .NET blogging right now. So many more more great new blogs are starting up, and you don't have to do a, a fifteen part series on and redo our documentation. Something like this can be a great uh, yep. a great foray. So if you discover something and it's a nice clean little post, mm -hmm. do do like Andrew Locke and 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 write a little blog post. Yep. Or do you like Rick Stroll and write a huge blog post? Um, so <laughs> uh, here These he's writing. They're amazing. Yeah, they're incredible. And so here's a, you know mini ebook, error handling and exception filter dependency injection on ASP.NET Core APIs. So tons of code, lots of you know, and he always kind of will go through and say, "This is what didn't work for me. I would have expected mm -hmm. this to work," and et cetera. So well, and what's great about this? This is part of his his larger. If you scroll to the very top. This is part of Rick's larger album viewer sample right there in the first line. Click on that. This is his, his, his ASP.NET Core uh, VNX sample application. So if you want to learn how to do web APIs and Angular front ends, uh, mm -hmm. this is being actively developed, and he's having all sorts of fun. He's been working on this for on and off for a year. Time, yeah. There's a lot of great samples. I'll do a blog post showcasing this, some of the nice samples that are out there. Yeah, this actually goes back to 2014. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great stuff. Um, <laughs> okay, this is from 
Bruce Wheelton, and this is kind of a more, you know, higher level overview. What's in there? This is uh, looking at kind of at the ASP.NET Core in the enterprise. So how does this affect the enterprise? Um, so maybe a nice one to share your boss. This is nice uh, article style. Uh, two on Angular. So this is from Damian Bowden. This is on Angular to autocomplete with AS, ASP.NET Core and Elasticsearch. He's done a few on Elasticsearch, so nice to see that integration. And another one on ASP.NET Core with Angular 2, and this is kind of a article style. Here's how to integrate it, set it up, and all that stuff. Uh, so Mete, I believe, I'm not sure how to say that, Meet, Mete, uh, on managing containerized ASP.NET Core apps on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes. Let's just, just take a moment, though, and yeah. have a moment because we are on the ASP.NET community standup and we are showcasing the Google Cloud Platform blog. Mm -hmm. So I want to yeah. make sure that the folks that are listening right now, just take a moment, don't scroll around, John, screenshot this and tweet <laughs> that ASP.NET Core on Kubernetes on Google Cloud Platform blog. We'll wait. <laughs> there you go. Tweet this with a little screenshot saying how cool it is that .NET Core runs everywhere. Yeah. All right, yeah. scroll down a little bit. This is cool. They've been they've been you know doing some things. Uh, their previous posts I featured from them um, on you know making Google a first class platform for ASP.NET, and so this is this is great to see. And then Kubernetes as an orchestration framework for Docker, mm -hmm. um, kind of a higher level. So so that's really nice. It's from my limited understanding of a Docker, it's pretty easy to kind of spin up you know a container or two, but to orchestrate them and to make them all work together well. Um, usually, you're using something like Kubernetes or, or Swarm or whatever, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna call Mete and find out what's going on. Yeah, good stuff. Cool. Uh, okay, this is from Matthew, and he's talking about uh, working with environments and launch settings in ASP.NET Core. So this is very important. You know, are you running in development, staging, production, or something else you've set up? So he talks about how to do that using launch settings, JSON, etc. So this is a really this is something I think. You know, it's a 200 level or two, 300 level thing. People don't really see this at first as they start building an app, but this is a really core thing to understand about ASP.NET is the whole environment management. Um, yep, certainly is. All right, th that is really all the links. I do want to point out we've got Gitter, uh, the Gitter channel as well, gitter.im ASP.NET home. So that is another place to ask questions. Uh, reminding people that I get a question every single week, where are the links? Uh, so we always do a kind of a summary blog post on, you know, here's what we talked about and here's all the links for the week. So they always go go out there. Um, and then usually they're also featured on the ASP.NET homepage as well. So that's all, that's all that. We did have a question over Twitter from Dustin and he's asking uh, just what's the um, roadmap for ASP.NET 4.6? Is, is there still ongoing development, et cetera? So I'll throw that out to you guys and stop talking. <laughs> All right. Awesome. What are you working on, Demo? Oh, uh, I've gone deep on something in the last week. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I'll show you some stuff. Um, one of the things that we really cared about uh, when building ASP.NET Core was the ability to do good uh, telemetry and analysis of the application. Now. Just because we cared about it doesn't mean that we hit it out of the park and built a great experience. And I'll be the first to admit that there are some big gaps in what we delivered, but we certainly started. And so we, we added this new logger abstraction, the iLogger factory, and the ability to plug in different logging uh, providers, which means that you can have logs in your application go to um, a single uh, sort of uh, coordinator and then have those farmed out to whatever providers that you might choose to implement. And we ship providers for things like writing out to the console, for writing out through the uh, debug write, uh, for writing out uh, to, what else did we do? Well, then when the community sort of stepped up with other things like a Serilog uh, sync so that you can plug our logger abstraction into Serilog and then Serilog can spit them out to wherever you like. I think we also did one for the event, uh, the event log in Windows. And we played around with a few end-to-end -end ideas with that. So for example, we uh, we set up, uh, I think it's called uh, Elk, which is uh, Elast Elastis Elasticsearch, Logstash, and K uh, Kibana, which is a very common uh, set of, uh, sort of a, a common setup that people use in, 
in certain stacks for log shipping, you know, doing all the traces from the applications, sending them through uh, to a single place and having a nice big dashboard to see them. Um, just to prove out that we could do those things. But we didn't, you know, by no means did we sort of ship a turnkey solution for seeing great stuff um, from your application. We did spend a little bit of time curating the type of messages that flow through at the information level um, out to the console, and we set those up by default in um, the file new uh, Visual Studio template. So if I open my app settings here, you can see we even did work to wire up the config system to the logging system in the template so that you can very easily, just by changing uh, some uh, settings in your app settings.json file, you can change the different log level for the various logging sources that come from uh, your application. And we also went through our own code, like Entity Framework and MVC and Kestrel and hosting and uh, various middleware, and we you know, wrote the code to emit helpful log messages so that at least during development, uh, assuming you can see the console, or if you're in Visual Studio, you can see the debug output window, you can you know, get some information about what's happening. Now, we also uh, did uh, some integration work with the Applications Insights team, uh, who, as you know, run the Application Insights service in Azure, which is you know, a very powerful sort of uh, analytics and telemetry service. Um, but I was only made aware of their Visual Studio experience like, last week, like in reality, it was just last week I really found out about this uh, little known feature in uh, Visual Studio 2015. And so I've been looking at this experience uh, in Visual Studio, and then we've been looking at how we could better enable this experience by default, and then going further, how could we enable this experience by default with um, the least intrusiveness into the application so that even like file new empty ASP.NET Core web application would have an amazing sort of uh, analytics experience in Visual Studio. And then also looking at how we can integrate the logging that we built with existing uh, logging technologies that people might already be using, specifically um, ETW um, on Windows, uh, which a lot of people use the tool Perfue, which just went open source a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> to analyze. Um, and in, incidentally, there is a, a, an implementation for the .NET uh, side of ETW, which is called Event Source, on .NET Core for Linux, and it outputs to a different thing that I can't remember now. But I haven't looked at that thing, so I'm not going to speak with any authority on that. Just know that the, there is sort of an analog uh, for Event Source in .NET on Linux uh, to what we did with ETW on Windows. So this is an application where I was playing around with a few of these things. I'm just going to comment out that line for a moment, because what I want to show you are some of the other things that I did. So this was an application. Well, you know what? What I'm going to do is show you how I got to this, because it's not um, obvious. So there is this other mode of application insights in Visual Studio that I alluded to um, that a lot of people may not know about because it's a little hard to see. And because I didn't know about it until last week, I hadn't shown anyone this. And so I sort of blame myself a little bit for this. And is this just like an experiment in the sense of like anyone could have done it, but you did it? No, no, no. Like, like, well, what part in particular are you talking about? Well, you said that you were doing this and like you were adding these features to logging. I'm just wondering. Oh, well, no, so the, the, this is kind of, there's a there's an arc here, like which I won't bore you the details of. I'm going to show you something that works right now today that everyone okay. can do, and then That's I'm going to know. then I'm going to talk about what we're doing to try and make it better. Okay, and so today you uh, when doing file new, you can click on this add application insights to the project. And it looks a little scary um, if you're someone who's not particularly dipped their toe in Azure yet, because it's asking for usernames and it's linking to Azure subscriptions and la 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 la. Is it going to cost me money? Exactly, and that's why I think this experience isn't ideal today. What there is is this little known thing: is you can drop this down. It says install mm -hmm. SDK only. No data will be sent. So if I do that, so it's not going to make something in Azure then. Correct. So see, hosting cloud is off. That's and I'm going to click new web application. But then you might be asking, well, what, what good is that? Why would I want uh -huh. App Insights? Well, I didn't know that you could even do that. Right. And so the next question is, well, OK, I can do that. But what does that get me? So let me show you what that gets you and why I got so excited about this um, when I saw this last week. So I'm just going to hit F5 under the debugger, which is what you have to do today. And I'll talk a little bit more about some things that we're thinking about doing uh, moving forward to, like I said, make this even better. So this is building, do, 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 first build. John, it's your turn to sing. <laughs> Definitely my dead air here. Building stuff <laughs> with ASP dot core. <laughs> Storing packages. 
Look at those packages restore. There definitely needs to be a package restore song. Is this because that your internet sucks, or what's happening right now? No, uh, this is just, I, I think it's because I'm in the middle of a, a Google Hangouts call. <laughs> um, somebody go to Gitter. So Yanni says that there's a question on Gitter as well. Okay. Um, build is waiting for restore to complete, which I always is, go to task manager at this point and then like see what's going on. Well, no, it's, there's it's, a few. It's, it's going. See? Uh, I think it's just because my machine is doing so much. I probably, and I did What's restore.dg? DG? Where are you seeing that? I'm sorry. Minimize your, minimize your task manager. It says .NET restore, and then it passed in restore.dg. I don't know. Directed graph? Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't even. I don't know. I'm not going to start yeah, it must be a too much. Thing. You can do yeah, that. I'm just saying, though. It's <laughs> My restore is completed. It only took 81 seconds. Um, it's a long time. It was a long time, and it's now the build has succeeded. Martin says it's a temp file that NuGet uses. There you go. Debug yeah. is starting. <sighs> there we go. Okay, so after all that, now we pay the cost of Razor compiling my view for the first time, which requires it to load Roslyn, which requires yada, yada, yada. This is all stuff we're working on, by the way, because this obviously is not acceptable, even though my machine is very busy right now. And, like I'm using like 90% of my CPU, so I can't expect too much. But we want this to be as delightful to the developer as possible, and right now I am not delighted. What so kind of machine will... is this? I mean, I realize that you're sending this out... This is my like... Surface Pro 3. No, I mean, this, this, this is an Ultrabook, right? It's, it's two years old. It has a SSD. It has 8 gig of RAM. It shouldn't be this slow. All right. So let's go back to the running application. And people may have seen this window over here. This is, the, people do not understand how cool that window is. Right. Like, now, if, you, the, if you saw that and just closed it, you're missing out. Right, indeed. Now, I admit um, there has been some performance issues with this window. It, it, did, it did increase the time it takes for the debugger view to sort of open up. Um, we have acknowledged that, and there's some changes being made at the next version of Visual Studio to improve that. But there is a wealth of information in this window that I want to call out. Now, you can see down here that I'm now getting a whole bunch of information from Application Insights because okay, so of that SDK. You wouldn't have seen mode. that. If I you would not have like seen that. that. Okay. And you can see this Application Insights logo here. This UI is very subtle, and this is something else that we're working on. If I go back to the application and I navigate around, so I'm into the About page, the Contact page, I'm into the Home page, and I go back to Visual Studio. You can see I have little events that have shown up in the ah. chart here. Can you click yep. on those? Uh, you can, yep. And down oh, here, and it, cool. and it highlights it down here. Now, hang on, hang on. Oh, this is cool. So the better view, so this is interesting, right? A whole bunch of different stuff shows up sure, in sure, the sure. events view down here. But the mm -hmm. thing I really like is this thing up here. So you'll notice that there's this search telemetry toolbar, and it has an active counter of the number of App Insights events that have occurred in this debug session. If I click on that, it opens up the App in Insights search view. Yes, in this is cool. Video, okay? Now, you can see All here, local, to be clear, not Azure. -y. All local, absolutely all local. Now, what's interesting here is you can see I have uh, 15 requests Mm -hmm. uh, uh, events and yeah. nothing else. And I'll talk a little bit about that, why that is in a minute. If I click on one of these, you can see over here that I have all this interesting, what we call structured data. So it's not just a message. It's actually, right. you know, a bag of uh, key, in this case, event time, operation ID, request name, et cetera, et cetera, to some type of value. And you can see the UI very easily lets me apply a filter over this current debug session to say, well, only show me re events where request name yeah was on contact or go off and search for events in uh, through this UI to do that. This is the kind of stuff that like not to put too fine a point on it but this is where Visual Studio shines like you know say what yes. you will about doing work in text editors and and VS code it's great but when we say integrated IDE this is the kind of stuff we expect to see. Right. And I mean and as I said as I've been very clear there are a lot of flaws with this experience today. Most people don't know this exists because I didn't even know it existed till last week. So I am now very now that I've seen this experience I am like 100% committed to getting this turned on by default yeah. for ASP.NET Core projects um, and you know useful. So there's at the moment you can see that App Insights uh, has uh, different categories of telemetry events. These are their what you would call their primitives. Okay, so you can log a request, you can log a trace, you can mm -hmm. record a page view, an exception, a dependency, a custom event, um, and uh, a metric. We are only currently tracking requests. The only thing that the current template in Visual Studio, when you tick that SDK uh, box does is track requests. Now, the other thing is that when I exit the debug session, this data is still available. 
So it gets stored in memory currently and lasts just for this instance until the next debug session occurs, and then it will overwrite that data. So it is useful, but it's not brilliant. They are working to support multiple debug sessions so that then you can do really interesting thing like use App Insight's ability to do deltas and comparisons between two sessions. Um, John, why are you flashing your lights at me? <laughs> You're distracting me. He muted himself. He muted himself, and then all these lights went off in his view down there. <laughs> um, so that's coming down the line so that you'll be able to, uh, while VS is open, do multiple debug sessions, and then all that data will come into this database here, and then you can search across it, and then you can compare yeah, multiple sessions. And then eventually they want to even support multiple Visual Studio instances so that over time this database you know, it gets filled up with information from your application that you can then use to compare and look at history. The other thing this view does today is that if you have configured App Insights in your application to run in production, which doesn't require you to run in Azure because App Insights can actually collect data uh, from your applications even if they don't run in Azure, you can see that information here in this view and you can compare it to the current debug session uh, with with this with this tool that you have here, they also have a really nice um, uh, what's the word? They have a really nice uh, code lens integration feature. So code lens is this uh, feature in Visual Studio. See this here, which now, gives that, you. Does that work on Community or what version are you in? I'm in Ultimate because you know I have Ultimate installed. I have no idea what code lens. I will is. I will go and do a blog post on this okay. topic, and I will find out because I only use Community. Okay. So do you note here that there's a new code lens piece of data showing up here, which is application insights did not log any exceptions for this method in the last debug session, zero exceptions. It's tracking exceptions, tracking the call stacks that they occurred in, and then directly maps it back to the methods in my application so that I can see how many exceptions that particular method or one of the ones that that method calls, you know, if it's the entire stack, through uh, during the last debug session. This is super, super useful stuff. And this can also tie, again, up to that production data so that if this application is running production, has application insights monitoring it, you can, in Visual Studio, just by connecting this, see if this method has caused exceptions in production or one of your other yeah. environments. Really, really nice stuff. And the team ships updates to this experience, this Visual Studio App Insights experience, every three weeks. And it happens silently. It's part of the automatic VS Gallery sort of extension update magic. Um, again, I didn't know that. So this, this, this view here is constantly being refined, and we're now talking to this team directly to make this view even better for ASP.NET customers. Now, so far, we're only tracking one type of primitive, which seems super, super, li super limited. Now, if I'd thrown an exception, that would have shown up as well, because the way Application Insights hooks into ASP.NET Core right now is there a middleware that sits in the pipeline. And you can see that in the startup class. So down here, they add Application Insights request telemetry, and then they add Application Insights exception telemetry. So they can observe anything that happens during a request after this point here. But of course, there are other things that happen in your application. As I just started out saying, we do a whole bunch of logging in ASP.NET Core now, which none, none of that is showing up at App Insights because they don't have a logger provider. Um, and also, when your application is starting up, there's a bunch of code that runs before the first request comes in, and none of that's being monitored right now as well. So what I've been working on the last uh, week after I discovered this experience was it, some experiments with how we could improve this by uh, letting it do more. So I'm going to switch back to this other app where I was doing all this work, and you can see a whole bunch of stuff is commented out. I wrote a very rudimentary um, uh, logger provider for application insights uh, logging. So I'm going to enable that in this application. And then we'll do the same thing that I did before, but I'm going to uh, run the application with the logger provider turned on. Okay, So we should see a lot more information coming into the application. Now, I just have to make sure I've actually uncommented all the places, and this is the other part of the experience that I personally am not too happy with today, is you mm -hmm. do need to, App Insights is quite intrusive in an ASP.NET Core application. You can see I'm having to update quite a lot of places to get the App Insights stuff working correctly. Now, to be fair, I actually don't need to do the last two I'm doing here because the JavaScript and a browser and a a analytics feature doesn't work locally. It only works if you're running uh, with App Insights in Azure, so I could have avoided that part. All right. So let's go ahead and play this application, and hopefully I didn't miss any of the commented outlines there, and this will just work the first time. 
we will see. And if anyone has comments in the YouTube, I'm not looking right now, so yeah. if you two could just ask, you know, let me know. There are a few. So uh, first, okay. first of all, I did, I did verify CodeLens is not a community feature. It isn't professional or enterprise. Um, there, okay. there were a few questions, and I think you covered these, but I just, um, so somebody was like, hey, can you, can you repeat, how do I install this in my app? How do I get this to work in my ASP.NET Core app? Yep, so there is a second experience that you can do, which you can right mouse click on the project in Visual Studio after, um, after the file new has occurred, and there is an option in the right mouse click men menu on the project, so that's now running, um, to add the SDK to the project. However, it doesn't add the code in an ASP.NET Core application required to make it work correctly. So um, really the best way is to do a file new, go through the experience that I did, which is that little tick box, in the uh, file new experience for new project and then look at the code that's added and then copy that into your application. All right, so I just clicked around in this application where I have configured a logger provider. Now, because I have a logger provider, there is a lot more information coming into this application. I can click search here just to refresh this view. I'm gonna stop my debug session because I don't need to do that continuous to look around. I see I made four requests during this session, but I have 23 trace messages because now everything that ASP.NET was logging out is going into application insights. So that's useful. I've got a nice flat list and you can see now I've got a mixture of requests and trace information. What's super cool is that if I click on a request and then I click over here on track operation, you can see I get this really cool view, which is kind of like a, a waterfall chart, which is here's the, 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 the request. That's kind of the parent object that's tracking this entire operation. And then all of the tracing that happened by ASP.NET during that is correlated with that request. So we call this log correlation or, or trace correlation. And Application Insight supports that out of the box. And ASP.NET Core's logging abstraction supports that out of the box as well by, by way of what we call log scopes. And so you can see this is really cool because now I've got you know, timing information that's coming through from the trace messages. Application Insights is doing its own timing because it's correlating these three trace events with this overall request. And now I've got a nice wall clock representation of, well, overall, this request took 686 milliseconds. And I can see that at the 92 milliseconds point, the, um, the index method was being uh, executed on my controller, I can see the view result was being executed after 119 milliseconds, and then 388 milliseconds later, I can see that that uh, finished execution. So I can see that most of the time is being spent in executing the uh, the action result, which in this case obviously is a view result, and that's because Razor is being uh, compiled and served out to the application. So this is already a much richer experience just by way of us adding a, a log provider for application insights. So that was really, really cool to be able to see that. The next thing I did was to look at rather than uh, how could I go about getting this type of experience without having to have all the application insights code in my application because I want this just to work by default when I'm in Visual Studio. I want there to be a very easy upgrade step so that I can get this in production and have it connect through to App Insights in Azure, which obviously would require code in my application because it needs an SDK key, um, it needs configuration, that type of thing. But in Visual Studio, we should be able to do this stuff ephemerally. I should just be able to know that I'm launching this application and fiddle with it in whatever way I have to or set up the environment appropriately by whatever means necessary to get this rich experience in Visual Studio. So that's what I've been looking at. So one of the existing technologies in Windows that is really designed to do that is ETW, or Event Tracing for Windows. So we are already have written a logger provider for the new logging abstraction that goes to Event Source. And Event Source is the .NET API for using ETW. And so here it is. I, uh, now we haven't shipped this yet. It is code, it's open source, it's on GitHub. But this is a logger provider that we didn't ever actually ship. Okay, so if you want to use this today, you either have to grab it off of my get feed, all right, or you have to just grab the code yourself, copy it into your application, and use it that way. So I've got the package off my get. If you go into my project JSON file, you can see that the version of this is 110 alpha 1, blah, 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 some build number, okay? So this is just some random build that I pulled off the my get feed. But by configuring the logger factory, you know, as early on in the application as possible, which in this case is hanging off web host builder and adding that event source logger, now, Every single log message that is going through any part of EF or anything to do with ASP.NET Core where we are called through that logger abstraction or where you do that yourself in your application will go through ETW. And then I can use the existing ETW tools like Perfview, which I have over here, um, to monitor the application and look at the traces. So here's one I did earlier. Okay, I'm not going to monitor it now. I'm just going to open a previous session. So ASP.NET Core activity tracking. 
where I have successfully configured uh, ETW's activity tracking feature, uh, which is kind of like the scopes that we have in logging. So it allows different ETW messages to be correlated with each other. And, uh, and uh, had that hooked up into my ASP.NET Core application so I can see events as they correlate to each other. So I'm just going to select a few of these message types over here. And I'm going to get this view over here in Perfview. Now, for people who haven't used Perfview before, it's a pretty raw tool. Okay, It's very functional. It has a lot of features. It's not the most user-friendly thing in the world to do. But if you do persevere, um, you can get a wealth of information from here. And because it's based on ETW, you can get traces all the way down from the kernel like the, every packet going over the network card, every CPU interrupt, anything that happens in Windows, all the way down to the lowest levels of kernel of the kernel, log out ETW events. So whenever you're doing really in-depth analysis, including .NET, so anytime a method is jitted, anytime a GC occurs, you can have it do a stack sampling so that every second it grabs a stack from every thread running in the process. You can have it uh, grab a heap dump from .NET and have that get, get logged as an ETW event. It's very, very powerful, and because it supports correlation and everything is timestamped, it makes it's a very useful tool for isolating the things that happened around a particular event in your application. I'm going to tell it to display the activity ID over here and the arguments that were passed to uh, any event that occurred. And so over here, what you can see now, and I apologize if this is a bit uh, uh, small. I can't zoom in during, with the Google Hangouts. Um, uh, screen sharing. But you can see um, these are all the event names. This is kind of an, uh, uh, you don't really need to worry about the event names here. You only need to know these in order to get the correct events to show up in the view. Um, what's really interesting here is the activity ID and the arguments. So these activity IDs are nested, and these represent nested scopes of essentially logging that occurred inside my ASP.NET Core application. And so this one here, where it says uh, some activity started, this represents a new request coming into my application. It's been given an activity ID of 1.4. And then everything down here that starts with 1.4 is something that occurred during that request. And because this is currently sorted by wall clock time, I can very easily see that all these things were correlated with this request coming through uh, the pipeline. And incidentally, uh, ETW or Perfue also has uh, that uh, that pseudo field, that calculated field, like App Insights did to look at elapsed time. So I can add the elapsed uh, msec, I think it is, column, and I should probably put that before the activity ID. Let's have a look. Spell it right? No. Sometimes I have to cheat. Duration milliseconds, not elapsed. Okay. Fire enemy. All right. So now, any time that you uh, Any time that uh, Perfu has detected that an event has stopped, I'm going to have to resize this. Sorry. It's one of the quirks of uh, Perfu currently. It is open source now, so anyone seeing this who thinks they can fix it, please send a PR. Or make um, it pretty. Make it pretty. That would be great. Um, you can see now that any time one of these activities is stopped, um, I get an elapsed millisecond count, which is really nice. So I can see how long this entire section, uh, this entire activity took. Uh, which is great, really, really nice. And all this data is super, super rich. You can see that for any one of these logging events that occurred, ASP.NET sends through structured data, so it's basically a dictionary. It's like key value pairs, name to, to object. All that stuff was serialized and sent along with the ETW event so that I can see it in here. So we can see that here it was an action that was being invoked. Uh, MVC is, is the one that's logging this message. It was on the about controller. It was a view result that's being executed, and you can see that there was a message that was sent along, which was executed action method, whatever the action name was, is returned result, uh, action result. And so everywhere that we have that nice structured data in ASP.NET Core is also being flowed through to these ETW events. Now, uh, for people who are watching this and going, why are you using Message Analyzer? Message Analyzer is another Windows tool uh, that's great for analyzing these types of messages, and it supports lots of different log formats, including IES native logs, as well as event log and ETW. I did try to use that, and for some, some reason, something in what we're logging through ETW crashes the Message Analyzer view uh, that you would otherwise use to look at this data, so I couldn't. Um, I'm going to have to uh, chase that down and figure out why that is. Uh, but we didn't have any luck trying to, to get this information out using Message Analyzer. If you use Perfue, you can see that all the data is there. And all the uh, rich information, which is the really key part that we can now use to build a better experience than this flat grid, um, can be used as well. So the eventual goal, what I would really love to be able to say, is that the default experience in Visual Studio is something whereby you get this 
type of view of all the stuff going on. So the applications insights type view with a nice tree view of requests, all the exceptions, all the EF SQL tracing, all the application tracing from ASP.NET Core and your own stuff with all the filtering and the structured data stuff being preserved in here, all the timing information, all that stuff would just work by default and it would be gathered by way of the ETW events. And why is that important? Because it doesn't require any code in your application for that to occur. We're actually talking about turning on this ETW uh, integration, basically this line here, that any ASP.NET Core application could be monitored via ETW and get all that rich information just out of the box by default without you having to do anything. Um, so we, that's, and as I said, we've literally just started looking at this in the last week, and I'm gonna stop sharing you. Um, and so far, I'm really liking what I'm seeing, um, and I'm, I, I certainly hope that people think uh, that this would be useful, because when I look at that information in, in Visual Studio during a debug session, I'm like, yeah, I want this right now. I want to be able to see this information right now in VS when I'm doing ASP.NET Core. Nice. Impressive. Awesome. It's, it's, um, there, is there a big uh, performance impact to all that stuff that it's collecting? So big is obviously a relative term. Yeah. There is a performance impact. Um, I don't think it's one that you would notice while debugging. The ETW, uh, the, the, the people on the .NET team who do build the event source support say that the tracking that I have turned on here, which does the full activity correlation across async calls, across threads, so that even if the call stacks get split because of an async call, they join them all back together and correlate them with a single activity ID. That support starts to get noticed when you get to about 60,000 events per second. I was doing about four events per second. So not probably something you're gonna hit in VS, but it's certainly something that, the other thing about ETW is that it's kind of, it's a two way, it's kind of a pub sub model. So you generally don't pay the cost unless you actually have someone listening. So you can have it always turned on, so your application is always instrumented, but the application won't actually emit events unless there is a listener who has said that I care about events from this source, with this log level, with these keywords. And so it's designed to be left on all the time. It's on in the kernel all the time, and you don't pay the cost unless you're actually listening to the events. Does that make sense? Great. Yeah. Oh, cool. um, we don't have a lot of time for questions. We have no time for questions. We are a full hour into this, and I, have, 11, I have an 11. No, it's great. This is super useful. Too. I hope that people found this incredibly useful. I wish we could spend another half an hour doing stuff, but in three minutes, 11 o'clock meetings start. So um, let's maybe talk more about this as you discover more things, and I'll do a blog post uh, trying to dig a little deeper. That's cool. pretty good stuff. Thank you for sharing. Not at all, not at all. I was excited about this last week, so I wanted to share it with everyone on the show. All right, cool. All right, <clears throat> we will see you again in two weeks then, folks. Two weeks? And, uh, okay. Yes, and we recognize that we've been a little bit lame on doing the... Um, uh, the recaps and the links and the collections and stuff like that, but again, this is kind of a volunteer thing right now. Um, Jeff, uh, when Jeff's not on the road, he will work on that. And uh, cool. See you all later. All right. I will engage the uh, dramatic zoom out, so don't forget that. Dramatic zoom out. It's so dramatic. So dramatic. Mm -hmm. Here it goes. Very exciting. Boom, boom, boom.